but we are fortunate to have a treat prior to the break with Michelle Fahm coming to us from Columbia Business School, the Kravis Professor of Marketing there. Michelle got his PhD from the University of Florida and again takes the psychological approach, so we have you switching back and forth between those who like Greek letters and those who don't. <laughs> and we're moving back to one who's, who's less fond of them. Uh, he studies mostly affect, mood, emotions, how that affects consumer decision making and other consumer behaviors. Uh, he was the president of the Society of Consumer Psychology, the leading organization in consumer psychology. He's so in demand that he has been a visitor around the world in Shanghai, in Hong Kong. That it's because it's fun. It's actually just fun to evaluate things, whether you like it or you don't like it. And we call that the pleasure of liking or disliking. Now, Sherry has been the hero of uh, this morning. I'm going to continue. She is my co-author on, uh, on this paper, a great uh, doctoral student of mine. And um, so this is a project we've been working on for a number of years. And we have worked on it for a long time, collected a lot of data. There's over probably close to 3,000 consumers that we have tested in our lab. I'm not going to walk you through all the results, but you know, there's lots of data here. Uh, I'm going to tell you two things. One, uh, we have lots of data, but the caveat is that most of it is experimental, so we have to control for a lot of things. It's a little artificial, I will admit, but we have lots of data, and we think we can tell you a pretty coherent story based on the data, but we will admit that it is somewhat artificial, so bear with me on that. So let me tell you a little bit the paradigm that we follow is relatively simple. Um, uh, very often we are going to be using uh, judgments involving t-shirts. So we take t-shirts from a popular t-shirt website and we show them a series of t-shirts to consumers, one at a time, a set of 10. And then for each of these t-shirts, we ask them, do you like this, you don't like this? And so they just click to tell us you know, whether they like it or not. Okay? And then we're going to measure, hey, was it fun to do that? Those judgments that you had given us. So we're going to have these data points, yeah, this was fun, this was not fun. Now that data point in and of itself is not very interesting unless I can compare it with something else. Okay, so it's fun compared to what? So then you realize you need a comparison point, and to be clever, you have to be not just one comparison point, you need to have multiple comparison points. So our comparison points will be other judgments that people can make about these t-shirts that will be you know, not painful, right? The things that are actually easy to do, very common, early May, something that doesn't require a great deal of expertise that would be relevant to do. So we have a series of control conditions in each of our experiments. Okay? So here, in this ex particular experiment, one group, the experimental group says, I like it, I don't like it. Uh, the other group, we have three of them. Some of them tell us, it's more casual, less casual. This one is more colorful. This one is less colorful. This one matches the baseball cap. This one doesn't match the baseball cap. And then after they have done that, we'll tell them, hey, was it enjoyable to do this? Okay, that's a very simple paradigm that we use. And um, so let me show you the data and some of the many data points that we have in across many experiments we have conducted. So here's how much fun people have telling us, you know, this, these t-shirts match, this t-shirt match the, uh, the baseball cap, this one match or does not match the baseball cap. This is how much fun. They didn't mind, it was a 5.8 on a 7 point scale. They sort of enjoy doing it. They enjoy also looking at the colorfulness of those t-shirts. They enjoy telling us about the, how casual it is, casual or not casual. But if you look, if you ask them the question, did you like it, you don't like it, then you see there's a different pattern. They like it even more. That's more, even more fun to do that. Okay? So this is somewhat stylized. We just show them the t-shirt and if you're ready, in a rather contrived setting, we're gonna to try to make it somewhat more realistic. We bring them to the lab. We show them a, a real world website. This is an Abercrombie uh, and Fitch website. They browse through it, and then we ask them to record on a piece of paper the t-shirts that they particularly like versus another t-shirts, the products, or any products that they particularly like or dislike. And they write that on a piece of paper, which they give us at the end of the experiment. And the control group, we ask them to write down the, t the products that they particularly found colorful or not colorful. Okay? That's, a, that's the control condition. And then again, you know, how fun was this task, this experiment you just did? And then the pattern is exactly the same. You know, this is how much fun it was to do this task you just asked me to do. But if you ask me to look for things that I like versus dislike, you know, this, I find it more enjoyable. So now, uh, and we have lots of experiments like that, so I can tell you this is a pretty uh, uh, robust pattern. One question you might ask yourself, okay, do they even know that? Okay, do they have an intuition that this is going to be fun? A priori, not after doing it, but a priori, to be 
um, judging th things what you like versus not like. And uh, so we did an experiment like that where we tell them, you know, we're going to be looking at 10 t-shirts and we're going to ask you to make some kind of judgment about this and, you know, tell how much do you, would it be fun to do that? And so would it be fun to raise, to evaluate the price of these t-shirts? Would it be fun to evaluate whether it's for an older person, for a younger person? Would it be fun to evaluate whether it's going to be more casual or less casual? Would it be fun to be evaluating whether it's going to be colorful versus not colorful, about whether the gender matches the man versus the woman, or actually matches the baseball cap versus not? And this is overall, you know, and people gave us you know, a sort of levels of expected enjoyment of the task. But if we ask them, would it be fun to evaluate this, whether you're going to like it or not like it? You can sort of see, mm, that, that I want to do. This is really fun. This is something I want to do. This is something that people really enjoy doing compared to other judgments. All right, so now we see that people like to evaluate things. Now you know anything about the real world, you realize that not everything that you get to evaluate, you necessarily like. Okay? Imagine I ask you to say, how many of you like these ladies? Okay? Or how much do you like this car? How much do you like these dresses? Or this house? Or this guy? or maybe this product. A lot of things are not necessarily things that you find appealing. And so is there fun to evaluate things that you don't like? Right? That's the question. So you have to run an experiment. In fact, we have run multiple experiments on that. It's a very simple stylized one. So similar type of design as what we have seen before. We have showed them t-shirts. One condition, do you like, don't like it? The other condition is the control judgment. Is it colorful versus not? But now we select the t-shirt so that we have two sets. We have a set that we know from a pretest that it is quite appealing. And then we have another set that we know from a pretest that people actually say, eh, I don't, you know, it's not really. Okay? So there's, a, there's two sets. Right? And then we say, was it fun to evaluate those t-shirts? So let's look at the data broken down by the sets. Okay? For the people who looked at the t-shirts that were appealing, again, the same pattern. Okay? Liking versus disliking compared to a controlled judgment is more enjoyable. What happens for the things that's not appealing? I'll let you process that a little bit in your head to sort of uh, generate uh, some hypothesis about the data pattern, and I'm going to tell you it's exactly the same. So not only is it fun to evaluate the things that you like, but it's also fun to evaluate things that you don't like. So when you say, you know, I don't like this thing, and it is pleasurable for me to express this. Now I'll tell you there's some major implications that come along out of that. Okay? I'll come back to this later. So um, now why does it happen? So now you know, we also consumer psychologists and in academia, we have to not just to show phenomena, we have to explain the psychology behind it. It turns out that it's driven by two psychological processes. One of them it's called self-expression. People like to evaluate things and find pleasure in evaluating things because it's an opportunity for them to say who they are. So when I say, you know, I like Trump, it's saying, expressing something about myself. And people love to talk about themselves, right? Um, so so self-expression is a major thing that you will see is that word. Let me show you why, how it is, okay? uh, that, that it is. Okay? So here's a, an experiment in which, again, the same paradigm. In one group, you evaluate the t-shirts for likes versus dislike. In the control group, you evaluate for something else. In this case, it's casualness uh, versus more or less casual. But in, we have two conditions. In one, uh, one condition, you tell us, and we call that you externalize your judgment. The other condition is say, don't tell us. Do it in your head. Just internalize that judgment. Don't tell us. And at the end of the experiment, we're going to ask them, was it fun to do this, to do this task? And um, in the externalized judgment, which is the experiment we've been doing all along, the pattern is just as it was before. It's more fun to evaluate things for likes and likes and dislikes than it is to do a control judgment. But if you're only doing it in your head, the effect disappears. It's not fun to evaluate things if you can't tell me or if you can't somehow express whether you like it or don't like it. So something is very important is about it's the ability to express your like and dislike is the big driver of what is at work here. Now, we don't want you just to express, we want to express something about you, okay? It's the me that I'm expressing that counts. So let me show you that it is that. Um, one experiment, we ask uh, people to evaluate t-shirts do you like your dislikes? That's do as the usual. Here's how much fun they have doing that. Similar means as what we've seen in all of our experiments. It's actually very much fun. 
But in control condition, we tell them, don't evaluate it for you, evaluate it for one of your best friends. And yet to tell us about your best friends, likes and dislikes, it's not fun. Yes? So it's not just expressing something, your likes and dislikes, uh, likes and dislikes per se, it's about expressing your likes and dislikes that is really fun. Okay? It's self-expression, not expression of others. Okay? The other thing I can, uh, uh, that is driving the effect over and above is self-expression is something we call self-discovery. You know, one thing that people do all the time, which is, makes no rational reason for those of you who study rationality, you, get, you go to the fortune tellers, you read the horoscope, maybe you don't, but many people do. I'm sure a lot of us do, right? And, and then why do we do this? Because we like to discover something about ourselves. Now, we like to learn something about myself. Okay? And expressing what you like or dislike is a way by which you learn something about yourself. Okay? And so it's not just about telling others what you like, those like, and who you are, but it's telling and somehow realizing for yourself what kind of person you are. Okay? And um, so one experiment, this is a very complex experiment in terms of the way it was done. So I'm going to describe it at an abstract level. Um, we have people evaluate not t-shirts this time. We have them looking at letters of the alphabet. And they look at letters of the alphabet. Do you like this letter? Do you like this letter? <laughs> Very exciting experiment, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then guess what? Guess what? It works. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Even looking at letters of the alphabet, but then compared to a control judgment, we say, you know what? I like it. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. Now, uh, now, it's fun, provided we do one thing. It's fun if we give them a sense that by doing this judgment, they learn something about themselves. Okay? If we somehow remove that sense of learning, poof, it disappears. Okay? And so, so there's a, this sense of learning about yourself is another reason why people, um, people uh, like to make those evaluations. So here's a slide that summarizes our results. People evaluate all the time. It's not, because they're some, not necessarily because there's something to do out of the evaluation, people evaluate all the time also because it's actually fun, even if you don't like the things you evaluate. Okay, that's the general findings, and there are some two major psychological processes that are at work. So now there are some marketers here uh, in the audience, and then why would we care about this? I think it matters. Okay? Uh, one of the things that really uh, is important for, for many content providers is about engagement with their materials, right? In the online world, super important. And then everything is about engineering greater engagement. So I've done consulting work with this company here called DNA Info, which is a, a hyper-local news. You know, and at, at that time I was engaged, I had not finished this research, and I didn't realize what it had to say, but so I gave them a bunch of advice that I think I could have supplemented uh, with this in other findings, but how do I get engagement with this news? Okay, and I could do lots of things, but you know, just simply providing a method for liking it, disliking it, that is a very cheap mean for engagement. You don't have to do anything about the ratings. Just providing the opportunity for people to do the ratings. Maybe the link doesn't even work, but just that device that people provide the ring, that is a way to increase engagement. Now, you don't have to do that just in the online world. Okay? Think about what we do in marketing uh, in any retailer, we always wait until a transaction has been completed before we ask the consumer, did you like it or you don't like it? And that's, you know, that's, of course it's useful to sort of see they like our product or not, but what we are depriving ourselves of is another source of experience utility we could be providing. So there's lots of consumers who spend time on your site who are not gonna buy anything, and then yes, and those guys, when they go, you say, well, there's no value I've provided. They have not done anything. They just look at this. What well, you could have provided a little bit of uh, experience utility by giving them an opportunity to evaluate things prior to purchase. Things that you just brought in. Do you like this product? Do you like this product? You don't like it? That is another opportunity. So when you have all these consumers showrooming, which is one of the major complaints retailers now are raising. Oh, they come in and they look at our stuff. They take pictures and they go. Well, you know, well, why don't you give them a chance to rate the stuff? And they're right, I like it, I like it. And I, I think there'll be two things. First of all, you create experience utility, and I bet that you increase commitment and an opportunity for you to eventually do the transaction. Um, no, so if you even have in the old world of catalogs, there's still some catalogs that exist out there. Uh, so you, you show things out there. We just show our products. We never provide 
a way for people to say, I like it, I don't like it. You know, you have this big IKEA catalog you receive in your home, right, or you carry it. So yes, yeah, so and what if you, instead of just showing the product per se, you had a little bit box like this. I said, you know, these things can do like, I bet this thing, A, they will enjoy it more. And second, you increase commitment that for some of the product that they like, they might even have a transaction. Implication number three. This is uh, connected to some of the questions that the Vail's uh, uh, exec had. Uh, you know, there's a lots of problems with response rates. You know, the, we have sent our surveys and we do want to get feedback from our consumers. They don't bother to give us their liking, right? And we need the data. Now, well, the question is, how do you ask a question? You know, and so, yes, we know people not only do that, but there's still a bunch of people who are not going to do it because they don't see enough value in giving us that ratings. Now, let's go back how we ask that ratings. Imagine I am, I am a um, um, chief advisor, okay? And I send this thing to the consumer. In fact, this is something they sent me. And they will say, have you been there? Travelers want to see more reviews of this place. Now, as a consumer, why would I want to do that? I'm not that helpful to others. I don't care about the others. Who do I care about? Me. <laughs> Me. Now, change the question. It's not about helping others. It's about giving me a chance to express who I am. Now, I'm going to change the wording. And I will say, finally, tell other travelers how you feel about this place. And I bet response rate goes up. Because it's not about the others. It's not about the place. It's about you. Okay, and whenever you give an opportunity for people to express who they are or to feel that like they know by this expression what they are like, that is something that is very motivating. Now, the last thing I want to share with you is something that really puzzled me for a long time. Okay? I, um, I go on Yahoo, new, on Yahoo you know, almost every day. I'm a little bit addicted to Yahoo. But lo and behold, almost every day, especially in the evening, there's issue, about half the page is full of Kardashians. <laughs> it's full of Kardashians, right? And, I, and then I look at the comments, and all the comments that people have on the Kardashian you know, 20 articles, it's all negative. People just write this, you know, I don't want to see them. Yahoo, stop, stop giving us the Kardashians, right? And we are sick and tired of reading. It's overwhelmingly negative. And I say, you know, as a naive marketing professor, I say, you know, don't they get it? You know, it's really obvious these people don't want to see it. Now I realize that, wow, that's not the real way to look at this. Because I think, now when you realize that people have fun to tell you they don't like things, now you can monetize that. You can monetize the dislikes. So look at some of the properties that people really hate, and then give them a chance to tell you they don't like it, and then you make money out of that. You know, it's a little bit some of the things that some of the, the gossip magazine have learned a while back, okay? That you can make money out of people disliking things, but you have to give them a chance to tell you, okay? So thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you enjoyed the talk, like it or dislike it, but express it, you'll feel better. <laughs> All, right. All right, any questions? Yes, Tali. So, so you gave this IKEA example, and yeah. if you just add the stars, but there I'm expressing myself, but who is going to receive it? I thought the important component is that there's an audience, that somebody will actually. Right? I think that if there is an external representation of your, of your, we have not done that experiment where imagine that like you write in our surveys, you like this t-shirt or not, and then I take it and I throw it in the garbage, right? That experiment, we have not done it. We think, and I think, I, mean, I don't know, Sherry, you feel free to disagree, but uh, I think that the mere fact that you have put it on a paper and you have expressed it externally, will be sufficient, even if there's not a real audience. Because don't forget, you're also a part of the audience. You know, the extent, I have at least told myself that this is something I like or I dislike. Uh, yes, Pete, and then we'll go there. Yes. So instead of um, like an election, instead of voting for a candidate, suppose we just had a like-dislike for each one. Do mm -hmm. you think that voting rates could go up? <laughs> <laughs> I, they're very good. It's, it's a great application. It's a great implication. I mean, how do you get more people to the voting booth? Okay? And you say, now you're going gonna to give us two judgments. Okay? You're going to tell us who you want to vote for. But by the way, while you're there, tell us also who you don't want to go. Something like More opportunities to express yourself, I bet it's going to go off. Now, especially in these elections. 
in this election, <laughs> oh my God. You know, you can see, you can see from the primaries, yeah, the people really want to tell you the people they don't like. Right? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, no, so yes, please. Uh, so my question was uh, regarding, so you mentioned about the uh, shopping experience where you can like ask before the purchase actually happens. Yeah. So did you try to see if like the fun element drops if you have to actually follow up on your uh, expression? Like if they say, I like this dress and then you say, do you, will you buy this? Does that like fun element go down if they have to actually? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. We, the, answer, the short answer is no, we have not done that experiment. The, the follow up answer would be, you know, to go to Kelly, she has started some social psychology work. Uh, there's a guy that's mentioned in her slide called Bob Cialdini and everything that seems to come up from his literature is that most people have made a small step one way, they make it more likely to keep going that way. So the prediction would be without no data, <laughs> except than his, would be, would be the fact that people are more likely to follow in, 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 that, in that direction. The expectations might be okay, inflated, but they're more likely to, to follow through with the behavior. Okay. I think there was one hand on this side. Yes, please. Which is more pleasurable, just a simple like? Or like this like, or that five point? Yeah, yeah, we've, we've done that experiment. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. It makes, no difference. it makes no difference. At least we've done it uh, both binary, we have done it five point scale, and it doesn't make a difference. So it's, it's also pleasurable. It's really about the content of what you're expressing rather than the exact format. And you know, the other stuff, where you like this color or not, why is that less pleasurable? Is it because it's more work? Uh, we have control for everything you can imagine, that, so we have lots of uh, control judgments, but there's, we chose these ones because it's easy to do, right? And, and so there's, uh, there's no uh, difficult, this difference in difficulty or, or fa familiarity, whatever. These are all fairly ju uh, common place judgment to make. I have zero minutes I'm supposed to get off the stage, is that right? Is that my hint? Okay, so we can talk at the break, thanks.